Here I will talk about our work on a new um, I/O scheduler um, for flash-based solid-state disks. And it's called FlashFQ, and it's based on the classic fair queuing resource management. This is a collaborative work with uh, Stan Park, uh, who is also from the University of Rochester. I'll start with a discussion on the fairness of uh, fa uh, flash I/O. NAND flash-based storage devices can achieve much faster I.O. performance compared to the uh, traditional hard drives because they do not suffer from the mechanical seek and rotation delays. And also because they don't have any seek delays, the classic seek reduction I.O. schedulers really present little values to these devices. And indeed, you can achieve very high I.O. efficiency when you don't do any OS level scheduling. That is, if you simply just pass through uh, all the requests to the device uh, immediately without any delay or reordering, you actually have pretty good efficiency on the flash devices. However, beyond the efficiency, uh, fairness is also a very important issue uh, in multitask systems and cloud-based systems. And one particular concern is uh, that the heavy I.O. operations can unfairly block lighter operations on these devices. For example, the writes typically consume much more resources than reads on the flash device, and therefore the writes can unfairly block reads, and large I.O. operations can also block small I.O. operations. Certainly, uh, there are existing uh, fairness-oriented I.O. schedulers. Uh, the previous fair I.O. schedulers are mostly based on time slices. That is, um, one task has exclusive access uh, to the device during its time slice and then time slices of different tasks then alternate to achieve fairness. The time slice schedulers, however, um, have some problems, uh, two particular problems that we want to pay some attention to. One is that they may exhibit poor responsiveness. If a request is issued right after its task's time slice expired, then the, ta then the request has to wait for all the other tasks to go through their time slices before its service. And this delay can be particularly long when there are a large number of uh, co-running tasks in the system. Another problem is that time size schedulers uh, cannot easily exploit the parallelism on the device because um, there is only one task that can access the device at any given time. And this is problematic for flash devices with substantial parallelism. Now, given these problems with uh, time slice based IO scheduling, uh, we have set our sight on a different class of uh, resource schedulers called fair queuing. The fair queuing actually originated uh, in the network packet scheduling. Uh, on network packet switches, um, the switch uh, schedules the packets uh, between multiple network flows. Fair queuing achieves fairness through a careful maintenance of virtual time. In particular, the virtual time for a task or network flow roughly indicates the accumulated resource usage for the task. The fair queuing scheduler then tries to balance the virtual time progression um, and therefore equal resource usage between the tasks by dispatching the request from the task, by always dispatching a request from the task with the slowest virtual time. One important problem or issue that um, is important for the fair queuing schedulers is that is the management of uh, so-called underutilizing tasks. These are tasks that do not immediately use their allocated resources with some idle time during their execution. If these tasks are allowed to build up their unused resources and then dispatch them in a single large burst, that will cause long delays for all the other tasks in the system. So typically, a fair queuing resource scheduler has to be equipped with a mechanism to prevent these underutilizing tasks from building up the unused resources for such bursty dispatches. And then we look at a sort of a simple graphic illustration that contrasts time slice I/O scheduling versus uh, fair queuing. Uh, the first row here shows uh, the time slice scheduling between two tasks. Each task has exclusive access to the device during its time slice. And then task one becomes unresponsive during task two's time slice. The second rule here illustrates what happens with the fair queuing, which provides better responsiveness because the tasks can switch much more frequently, depending on the request sizes. And the third rule further shows that for fair queuing, it's very easy and straightforward to exploit parallelism on parallel I.O. devices. The system simply dispatches multiple requests 
to the device at the same time, the fairness can still be maintained by balancing the progression of the virtual time of different tasks. And such parallelism will be hard to exploit um, for time size scheduling when a single task is allowed to access the device at a given time. However, there is one important concern with uh, using fair queuing for I.O. scheduling. And that concern is that under fair queuing, there could be very frequent task switches. And this also, uh, this typically lead to a loss of spatial locality in I.O. The reason is simple. The requests from within a single task tend to be more spatially near each other. And if you switch tasks more often, then you break those spatial locality within a single task. And this is a significant problem for mechanical disks. And that's probably the reason why the fair queuing was never seriously advocated for scheduling on disks. But the loss of spatial locality is much less a problem for flash devices. Uh, for writes, for example, although the um, raw flash medium desires the sequential writes, logically random writes uh, often become sequential writes anyway through the block remapping done by the firmware of the uh, solid state storage. And here's a, um, a picture that shows um, some, uh, shows, some, shows some tests that demonstrate the performance penalty of random I.O. Um, uh, compared to the sequential I.O. performance. So we have the uh, results for uh, small reads, small writes, uh, large reads, large writes on three different solid state storage devices. What we see here is that um, uh, there's almost no, uh, very little performance penalty for random I.O. in all the cases except for small reads where there can be up to a factor of three slowdown by the small reads, um, the random I.O. compared to the sequential I.O. But it's also important to note that the small reads in a sequential stream are oftentimes in practice merged into larger reads uh, at the block layer by mechanisms such as the, uh, divide, uh, the, uh, the, divide, uh, the queue plugging and the request merging, for example, in Linux. So in practice, uh, those small reads uh, are unlikely to reach the I.O. schedulers if they indeed belong to a sequential stream. And these reasons um, I explained above uh, substantially alleviated the concern of losing the spatial locality of using fair queuing scheduler for flash-based solid state storage. And let's move on to look at uh, the basic design of the, uh, flash IQ, uh, the flash FQ scheduler that we um, devised. Our flash FQ scheduler builds on one of the classic fair queuing schedulers called SFQD. And we chose SFQD for two reasons. One is that it uh, uses the request start time to order the request scheduling, which is relatively easy to realize. The second reason is that uh, SFQD allows parallelism, which is important for flash devices. Specifically under SFQD, each request has a start tag, which is roughly the owner task's accumulated resource usage before the request is service. I can think of this as the task's virtual time. And the request dispatches are then ordered based on their start tags to achieve fairness. And parallel dispatches are allowed up to the depth D. As I explained before, a fair queuing scheduler needs to prevent underutilizing tasks from building up unused resources for bursty dispatches. On the SFQD, what it does is that it maintains a system-wide virtual time. And this is basically the minimum virtual time from all the active tasks, those that have outstanding requests. And keep in mind that the system virtual time computation ignores those tasks that are currently idle. And then the system virtual time is used as a lower bound to, when setting the request start tags. So if you think about a situation when you have an underutilizing task that's been idle for a while, then issues a request, and that request to start tag will be brought forward to at least the current system virtual time. And this will typically bring forward the task virtual time uh, beyond its actual accumulated resource usage. That basically loses the unused resources when it was idle. And that's actually exactly what we wanted. While building on those classic um, um, fair queuing scheduler, these classic schedulers uh, were not used or intended to address issues on flash devices. And in fact, they were not really never used uh, in operating system I.O. schedulers. 
And we have to identify and address new challenges in designing the flash, uh, flash FQ scheduler. One of the challenges we have to deal with is the restricted parallelism on flash. So the issue is that although flash uh, devices contain um, parallelism through the multiple channels within a flash device, the parallelism is often uh, restricted or uh, subject to some interference between concurrently executing uh, I.O. operations. And here's one illustration of uh, the parallel I.O. speed up, um, that is the parallel I.O. performance uh, compared to the sequential I.O. performance for small reads, uh, large reads, and small writes. And on this drive, what we see here is that only the small reads actually exhibit large parallelism. Writes exhibit almost no parallelism. And large reads also exhibit very little parallelism. In this case, it's probably because a large read already utilizes uh, all the multiple channels in the, in the flash device. And we also find out that uh, if we actually issue the reads and writes uh, at the same time, even the parallelism within the small reads would disappear. This is what we see on this device, and we see somewhat different behaviors on other devices, but they all exhibit some kinds of restricted parallelism, where the parallel I.O. Uh, does improve efficiency in some cases, but the interference also exists among the concurrently dispatched I.O. operations. So this raises a challenge. That is, we must exploit the parallelism, but also manage the, the interference that comes with the parallelism. And given such interference between the concurrently dispatched requests, Parallel dispatches without careful control from the I.O. scheduler will lead to unfairness. In particular, a writer that issues write requests on flash devices would utilize more resources than a reader does if they're issued in parallel without any scheduler control. Our approach is to uh, account for each task's resource usage through its virtual time. That's the standard part of the scheduler. Then we um, add a mechanism called a throttle dispatch that basically blocks a task if its resource usage is excessively ahead of the slowest active task. And during this blocking period, the slower tasks can then catch up at less interference on these devices. The other challenge we have to deal with is the issue of deceptive idleness in I.O. systems. The existing fair queuing schedulers are all work conserving. What that means is that they never idle the device when there's pending work to do. And that's right, because you probably don't want to idle the device when there's, no, when there's pending work to do anyway um, to achieve high efficiency. But then there's the issue of uh, deceptive idleness. So think of a situation where you have an active task that continuously issues I.O. requests one after the other. But then there's just a small little gap, a little interval. From the time that an I.O. request returns to the um, um, task from the time that the next request is issued due to some probably software processing. And during this short interval of gap, the task would appear as being temporarily idle to the operating system I.O. scheduler. And this is what we call deceptive idleness. The work conserving schedulers do not recognize such deceptive idleness. And this is known to cause poor performance on mechanical disks because they tend to lead to more frequent switches of tasks and therefore a loss of spatial locality. Loss of spatial locality, as we discussed before, um, is not a big uh, performance problem for flash devices. However, the deceptive idleness indeed causes poor performance, of uh, poor fairness, which is something we do care about. In particular, when a task is deceptively idle, that is when it doesn't have any outstanding request, the system virtual time may advance uh, excessively so that some of the resources of this deceptive idle request uh, a task is lost. The system virtual time mechanism was designed, as we explained before, to uh, prevent un uh, underutilizing task from building up its unused resources for bursty dispatch. But here, this mechanism is misplaced to unfairly take away resources from an actually active request uh, it, that sort of temporarily idle deceptively. And our solution to the deceptive idleness is a uh, uh, IO anticipation technique for fairness. The anticipation technique under uh, flash FQ is to let a task stay active continuously 
uh, when those deceptive idleness appears between its consecutive requests. There are two anticipation rules on the flash FQ. The first rule is that um, the system virtual time maintain maintenance considers these tasks as active by using the task's next anticipated request that hadn't really arrived yet as a hypothetical outstanding request when computing the system virtual time. The second anticipation rule is, is that the throttle dispatch technique we discussed earlier also considers such tasks as being active when deciding whether another task is an excessive resource overuser and therefore should be blocked. It's important to notice, to note that um, IO anticipation may violate the work conserving property. Uh, in particular here, the second anticipation rule may idle the device while there is actually pending work from an excessive resource overuser. And this violates the work conserving property and leads to wasted resources during the idle time. So in some sense, this really presents a conflict between fairness and efficiency. And therefore, it's uh, important to set anticipation timeout carefully uh, so that we don't lose too much efficiency when maintaining fairness. However, not every anticipation uh, violates the work conserving property. Uh, in particular, the first anticipation rule uh, in our system does not block any requests, and therefore, it does not violate the work conserving property. And therefore, we can set a much longer anticipation timeout without worrying about losing efficiency here. And one other point that we want to discuss um, with respect to the flash FQ design is the need of knowing a request resource use before it completes. This is a subtle issue that a lot of the fair queuing papers do not explicitly address, but it's important to understand it when realizing it in practice. For uh, fair queuing schedulers that use the finish time to order the requests, the finish time computation of a request actually requires the resource use of the request, and therefore the, re the request cost must be known at the time of scheduling. But in general, for the start time based fair queuing that orders requests based on their start time, there's no need to know the request cost at a scheduling time. But subtleties for those schedulers that allow parallelism, including our flash FQ, we have a situation where one request from a task is currently in the system and the new request for the same task arrives. To compute the start tag for the new request, we must know the finish time of the current request in the system, and therefore we have to know its cost before it finishes. The need of knowing request resource use before it completes is an inconvenience for IO schedulers. Fortunately, we can estimate uh, IO operations resource use based on its type, that's being either read or write, and size uh, for flash devices. For reads and writes respectively, uh, we can assume a linear model uh, with a down zero offset to model um, the relationship between the IO size and its resource use. And we'll do some simple calibration for each device ahead of time, and then use it uh, to estimate a resource use based on request size at a runtime. There are a number of uh, implementation issues that we ran into that I want to uh, discuss over here. We have implemented the flash FQ scheduler in the Linux operating system to regulate IO resources by concurrent applications. On the uh, cloud computing platforms uh, where, um, um, for example, uh, which, for example, uses virtual machines to encapsulate services, the flash FQ design can also be implemented in a virtual machine monitor to manage IO resources between multiple uh, virtual machines. One particular issue that we ran into was the, the queue plugging and the request merging uh, mechanism in the Linux block layer. What it does is basically, when you have a bunch of small IO operations uh, as part of, uh, that are part of a, a sequential stream, what you really want to do is to actually hold those small IO operations until you can merge a bunch of them into a larger IO before dispatching them to the device. And this is a very critical performance enhancement technique but it causes complication for fair queuing schedulers. Because when you try to merge a new request with a request that's already in the queue with its tags and virtual times already decided, you have to recompute the virtual time for both requests and tasks involved here. Another implementation issue that we ran into is the uh, 
concept of IO context, which is the Linux resource principle that's the basic unit to receive fairness in a Linux system. By default, a process or a thread has its own unique IO context. And you can also um, merge or group multiple processes to share a single IO context. This is important or useful when you have, for example, Apache web server that uses multiple processes to service requests. However, in practice, we find this Linux IO context management is very hard to use. Now, we're surprised, for example, first by that it's impossible right now to group multiple threads together in IO context. And even for process grouping, there's some problem if you try to group processes IO context if they have not been previously initialized. And one last issue is the IO context for journaling daemon. The journaling daemon in the ext4 file system has its own unique IO context by itself. And this is not right because the journaling daemon doesn't do its work for itself. Instead, it does those work on behalf of the applic applications that issued original IO um, requests. And we have fixed some of these problems needed for our experimental studies in this work. The goal of our experimental evaluation is to demonstrate the fairness and high responsiveness of the Flash FQ scheduler we developed. And we compared against the several alternatives. And one alternative is the raw device IO, where the scheduler simply passes through the requests without delay or reordering to the devices. And we also compare against the default CFQ scheduler on Linux. Linux, Linux CFQ is actually based on time slices. But the time slice ends if the task appears to be idle, even when it's deceptively idle on flash storage. And we also include another uh, scheduler that maintains or enforces the time slices strictly. That is, a time slice always runs to its end, even if much of it is idled by the task. And we call this the quanta scheduler. And it sort of prioritizes the fairness over efficiency. And we also compare against the file scheduler, which is our previously developed time slice based scheduler specifically for flash storage. And finally, we compare with the original SFQD scheduler without the support for throttle dispatches or anticipation for fairness that we have presented as part of the flash FQ. So we'll can look at some evaluation results, and this is the evaluation for uh, the fairness. Uh, it's a very simple test where we have two tasks, one issue reads and one issue writes, and the two tasks run together on a system uh, with a flash device. And uh, we look at the performance and the fairness of the two tasks under, um, on, under these different um, IO scheduling regimes. The performance metric here is the IO slowdown ratio, which is basically the task's IO um, performance uh, under concurrent execution compared to its speed under sequential execution without um, um, any interference. And here the IO slowdown ratio of two is what we call proportional slowdown. And basically, if you have two tasks that compete for the resource on the same device, the fair outcome is that each task suffers a slowdown of a factor of two. What we see here is that the three schedulers, Quanta, Files, and Flash FQ, can achieve fairness in this, exp in this experiment. The raw device IO doesn't provide fairness, obviously, because it does not care for it. However, the Linux CFQ and SFQD uh, do try to achieve fairness. They fail to do so because of their mismanagement of the deceptive idleness situations we described earlier. And we further look at the responsiveness of the, um, of the same experiment. Here we show the worst case response time for um, uh, under different IO scheduling regimes. Among the three schedulers that have uh, fairness, that support fairness, Quanta, Files, and Flash FQ, uh, only Flash um, FQ can, um, can achieve fairness and high responsiveness at the same time. The Quanta and Files schedulers fail to um, provide good responsiveness because of their use of time slice scheduling, as we explained at the beginning of this talk. So here's another experiment where we uh, look at a, uh, the fairness of uh, realistic applications. Uh, one application we have here is the Apache web server. It's a read-only workload that reads mostly small files. And uh, it runs against the Kyoto cabinet key value store uh, that has large writes. In this workload, it replaces large records of 128 kilobytes. 
So the large writes in Qt cabinet are much heavier than the small reads in Apache web server on flash devices. When we run them together, uh, flash FQ again can achieve high fairness. And the quanta and the file schedulers uh, have better fairness than the other alternatives, but uh, their fairness are not ideal. And um, probably this is because the large uh, writes uh, in Qt cabinet workload um, overuses or uh, disrupts the resource accounting at the end of their time slices. And also, uh, quanta and files have worse response time than um, flash FQ achieves. So again, the result is that only the flash FQ scheduler that we developed can achieve both fairness and high responsiveness at the same time. And here I will conclude uh, my talk. And uh, the high-level message we really want to send through this work is that the fair queuing, the classic fair queuing scheduler um, developed, originated from the network packet scheduling is well suited for flash IO scheduling. And it's because the fair queuing is mostly work conserving. That's, that means it's efficient. It's also fair and highly responsive. It can also support IO parallelism, which is important on flash devices. And the, probably the only concern with fair queuing is the loss of spatial locality because of its frequent switches between tasks. This was a deal breaker for mechanical disks, but it's really not a concern on flash devices. And based on these motivations, we developed Flash FQ, which uh, builds on the classic fair queuing with parallelism. And it has, uh, we have presented new techniques, including throttle dispatch to address the restricted parallelism with interference on Flash. And we also proposed anticipation for fairness to address the deceptive idleness problem. The number of practical lessons we uh, have learned in the implementation of Flash FQ, um, but we believe these uh, problems can be addressed with a careful implementation of both Flash FQ and probably some re-implementation of Linux. And we believe the Flash FQ can be used practically um, very well. And uh, we're working on uh, releasing the source code of the scheduler. And this concludes my talk. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. State your name and affiliation, please. Um, I'm Raju Rangaswamy from Florida International University. Um, nice work, hi. And um, I had a comment about the loss of spatial, spatial locality, which you say isn't a big concern for Flash, but then you had some data early on um, that uh, said that random reads versus sequential reads for small reads, there is actually a difference. Right, um, so I, I'd just like to follow up on that a little bit. Um, because I think the way you explained this was that small reads do get merged into large reads. But that would work only if these reads are non-blocking, and typically reads are blocking. So processes won't issue subsequent reads un until previous reads actually complete. So maybe I misunderstood something there. Um, that's a, a, a very good point um, for the um, yeah, so the question is, for the blocking reads, small blocking reads, then um, they cannot be merged by the, um, the, the plugging and the merging mechanism. Right. And that's actually a very good point. So uh, in those cases, if you get, the, if you get the small reads that are also synchronous, then um, you basically uh, would have to um, send them one by one. And then there is a substantial cost, as we, as we saw earlier with the, um, the flat, uh, the the fair queuing. So, so you're right. That, uh, Does anticipation solve this in any way in, in your solution? It doesn't. Anticipation has nothing to do with that. So again, you know, th this is the one biggest concern with fair queuing, which is why it was never really using disks, because you really cannot ever afford that cost with uh, loss of spatial locality. And uh, with, with flash, the concern is much less, but still there's a problem with small reads. And, uh, and in the particular case you said, when those small reads are also all synchronous, then this cannot be addressed, and you have to suffer that cost. So that's a, that's a great point. Uh, does any of the other IO schedulers address them? Somebody has asked Sorry. a question as well. So we'll, we'll talk oh. more offline, but it's a great question. Peter Desnoyers, Northeastern University. And yes, I, I like this work very much. Um, I was just uh, I was interested in, in your actual, when you were actually getting this up, what sort of behavior did you see as far as, you know, did you actually get a lot of small requests that you were able to um, do in parallel or not? Do you have any feel for that? In other words, did you have multiple streams of small requests being 
uh, being interleaved. Yeah, so the, the question is um, um, how what, sort of the, the, the request size and the sort of uh, pattern uh, in yes. the work we have done. And we, uh, we have run, uh, so the, I guess the answer to this is uh, we have run two kinds of workloads. One is um, synthetic workloads, which we do try to uh, explore a range of different parameters. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I show very few over here, but in the paper we have a, a, a bigger range of them. And the, uh, we also have um, some real application tests with Apache Web Server and uh, the Qt cabinet um, uh, store. And there is a variety of, uh, of, of situations we run into. Um, and uh, in, in, on the case we have tested, at least you can see the paper that uh, um, yeah. our system exhibits a better behavior in terms of fairness than uh, the other systems do. Okay, thank you. Okay, while we ask the next question, would you leave Laura on the stage? Go ahead. Um, Myung Soo Jung, uh, coming from UT Dallas. Um, it was very nice work. Um, the, my question is that you assume that you could estimate the finishing time of the underlying SSD. So the, what if the SSD require more time than what you expected? For example, for lead, lead request requires sometimes lead disturbance problems or ECC engine problems, so which could more latency, uh, which could introduce longer latency what you expected. So do you have any concerns about this kind of non-linearities behind the SSD? Okay, the question is that, uh, you know, the, the schedule we have here requires the knowledge of a cost of a request before yeah. um, its completion. And uh, what we do here is that we use a simple linear model to estimate the cost based on size. The question is, you know, the prediction is not always right. And uh, with flash, you have all kinds of anomalies. That's exactly true. You don't always predict it correctly. When you're wrong in prediction, you basically misallocate or misaccount resources uh, uh, for that request. What you hope is that if the average is right, then over time you can you know, um, compensate it. Um, but I, I, you know, it's, it's definitely the case that this need of knowing the request cost ahead of time is a big inconvenience, and no other schedule really in the working system requires that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also, in some, some sense, surprised when we're deep in implementation and realizing this, and we went to ask the other SFQD schedulers or the fair queuing scheduler authors, and they tell us, oh, they actually have to use some even worse estimations than we use here. So it's one of the weaknesses that uh, we really have identified. And uh, I think it's good that, it, I guess, it's out in the open that we can look at uh, the, I guess, the, 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 the downside of it. Thank and you. thank, thank you, you very much for, for asking. Okay, let's thank the speaker.